and I give him his 600 shilling coin. The guy would look at the money, then he looks at me. He would practically, like, you can see, like, <laughs> money you can't handle. <laughs> then the taxi would be go. You tell the driver to get in there. So as he's closing the door and the taxi is driving off, the girl would pop his head out of the window and be like, Kuma Nyoko! <laughs> <laughs> now he, he tried. He failed. He failed to grab the guy like this, but with his last effort, yeah. he just slapped him with the back. Like, okay, you go and score, but you have my slap. <laughs> Chief, we blinked like this. That guy shot out of that shower like a bullet, back naked, by the way. <laughs> they hadn't fenced the trench. Yeah. So he just shot out of the shower, right through the crowd, into the channel, and vanished. After all, Adam never wore clothes. Field, mm -hmm. you play at halftime, you play at the end of the game. <laughs> Who would you say is the past of the team? <laughs> Can I shock you? Yeah. Gamma. Oh, oh gamma. wow. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at that... In front of Ginger Road Police. Yeah. So there's that katan when you're going down to Meme. Mm. Yeah. So the conductor tells the driver, these guys have refused to pay. Take them to Ginger Road Police. So the conductor goes and he just, like, he was in the inner lane. Yeah. Mm. So the inner lane. So he just stops and turns. And another taxi guy from behind comes in, thwacks him from behind. <laughs> oh. So when the... The other driver knocks him from behind. Immediately jumped out and he came and he asked the, uh, the driver of our conductor or the driver of our taxi, indicator you are, indicator you are. You guy, you did not indicate. Mm. You did not indicate. So in our, this confusion, the conductor is concentrating on the other side. This guy is concentrating, the driver is concentrating on the other side. I just grabbed the door open and we jumped out and ran. <laughs> in the middle of Ginger Road, by the way. <laughs> so... Another random, random evening where we uh, unfortunately have to redo this conversation because of one issue or the other, but uh, maybe it gives us an opportunity or you can call it a blessing to have someone that normally is not in front of the cameras more than once. I mean, how often do you see Scott when it's not a Saturday? Uh, more than once. <laughs> Only his workmates. He's hiding. To see him. Only his workmates. <laughs> start from there man what do his work welcome to the fat cats podcast and uh the first thing that was on my mind is it's ironic how one of the biggest teams in the country heathens has a slogan mungu ni wetu god with us i think if i'm not mistaken but then it is uh it's it is called the heathens so what do you have to say about that i tell you asama we are one of the most prayerful teams Mm. <laughs> in the league, I think. Talk about uh, who's the pastor. We of the pray team? before warm up. We pray before the game. We pray on the field. Mm -hmm. We pray at halftime. We pray at the end of the game. <laughs> Who would you say is the pastor of the team? Can I shock you? Yeah. Ooh. Gamma. Ooh, gamma. Oh, wow. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, huh? Ruben Kihumuro here. Um, uh, Bruno Akampa and. Uh, Introducing our guest uh, yet again, uh, George Scott O'Loach, um, self-proclaimed journeyman, the Iceman, and uh, a monitor article says that uh, 40 years, and I'm quoting this, 40 years, 20 seasons, and 10 titles, but still going. Um, he's played for Heathens, Cobbs, Rhinos, Pirates, Impis, Moamba, Harlequins, and maybe your Sunday church team. You may never know. <laughs> Scott, yes, sir. how are you? I'm doing fine. Right? Um, your second time in the shortest period at at, uh, at the Gardens, Nigeria. Third. The first one was the COVID. There, yeah, we did an Instagram <laughs> uh, space, uh -huh. there, uh, and then we did one last week, but unfortunately. Uh, something happened and then we have to have this conversation again and hopefully tell it better. That is the biggest challenge we have now. But anyway, Scott, um, let's start from the, the conversation we're having. What do your workmates think of you when they see you, especially those first days when you first got onto the job? Okay, when I walked into the office for the first time, I remember I, I was following guys, like, oh, the driver's room is that way. So I was like, 
I cut the corner to go to the driver's room. And the reception is like, hey, hey excuse me. <laughs> so I go to her and I'm like, yes, madam. She's like, uh, are you a visitor? I'm like, no, I work here. She's like, as what? I said, as a driver. She was in shock. <laughs> And remember, we became best friends from there because like, she couldn't believe that <laughs> to come to work. For... Uh, anyway, um, one thing came to mind when you were talking about that. Um, don't you have uh, a challenge playing hide and seek? Have you ever played hide and seek in your life? Or like yes. your, your recent life? A man as big as you, where do you normally hide in, in, in cases of hide and seek? Okay, in... The real life, mm. uh, hiding is not easy, especially when everyone knows you. Like you walk into a place mm. and you just want to stay anonymous, but the minute you walk into a place, like five people have already fingered you. <laughs> so in real life, hiding mm. is impossible. Yeah. But in games and stuff, is it possible to hide? No, you cannot. Unfortunately, mm. the only time when I can hide is when I don't have the ball, and people don't really care about me. What of ghosting? Ah, ghosting. Ghosting is hard. It's hard. Ghosting is hard. Ghosting is hard, because every time you try to ghost, something needs to be done. Mm. Tackle needs to be made. A rock needs to be covered. Yeah. Uh, this needs to happen. You have to support your teammates. You have to lift in the line out. You have to push in the scrum. You cannot ghost. But then, how how do you find how do you find that 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 work rate in fifteens, and the few times you've come on in the sevens, especially when 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 the when the sevens boys are in the national setup already called. There's when you come on and play for heathens in the seven some circuits. Yeah, just be thinking why he, he can be bored on a random weekend and he's like, guys, first put me on that seven stuff. <laughs> 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 I'm running with the boys. I'm like, ah, Scott. <laughs> I, I actually went to yeah. the Kitgum You went to Kitgum, yes. Yeah. <laughs> because I'd never been to Kitgum. Mm. Okay. I was like, hmm. Uh, let me go to Kitgum and see what's up. But uh. I'd trained. <laughs> I'd trained. I'd done a lot of stuff. Uh. I was fit. Mm. I think Tolbert assessed the team and gave me an 80. I was very proud of myself. Oh. Yeah. So Kitgum, I went to Kitgum because I'd never been to Kitgum. Mm. And sevens, I prefer sevens actually, if I'm fit. Really? Yeah, I prefer sevens. Why? Because of uh, more space? More space. Uh, more space. Because of uh, the, the, the big boys are not usually part of sevens and you can get to push the slightly smaller ones yes yeah. but then also when they get you when you're now in <laughs> no. defense and the gap yes no that yeah. is Small a problem boy rounds you <laughs> i remember when kit gum yeah. and you were playing cobs and pius got the ball yeah and i looked at pius and i remember telling pius as he was rounding me you I want to mention that one. <laughs> I was like, you, you little him. boy. <laughs> we didn't abuse him. Yeah. He actually laughed. He was laughing me as he was surrounding me. And I was laughing at myself. By surrounding me. So actually when he scored, I was like, ah, man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I miss those days when I It just could. reminded me of, I think it was a Heathens game again. Uh, no, it was a Cobbs game. Yeah. Joseph Arido broke the line. Um, and then, I think it was Coma. Yeah. Omar was still playing for Warriors at that time. <laughs> now, if he <laughs> tried, he failed. He tried to grab the guy like this, but with his last effort, yeah. he just slapped him with the ball. Like, okay, you can score, but you have my slap. <laughs> we all, even the ref, Ramsey was the ref. <laughs> 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 because now in the laws, what, what law is that? Tell me. But if you slap the back, you can as well tap the ankle. <laughs> yeah. so you can talk. <laughs> but Koma is a tall man. Yeah. How do you want him to he reach the ankle? To the ankle. Ah. Hey. <laughs> so the Koma even falls in slow motion. <laughs> what are you saying? Mm. But anyway, uh, Scott, what mantra do you live your life by? Uh, my mantra is explicit. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, this is a 18, an 18 and a half. plus. Uh -huh. uh, we are drinking now special. Thank you. My mantra is fuck it. Fuck it. Yeah. Why? The times when you're faced with situations that you literally have to 
throw or caution to the wind. Mm. Like, or beyond your control. Everything is beyond your control. But you figure out you might have a fighting chance if you give it your best shot. If you start thinking of hang-ups, when you're, oh, these guys are too strong for us, or, oh, I'm not fit enough, or, oh, I don't think I'm ready for this stage, you won't perform. Okay. You won't perform. Interesting. Yeah, so you just say, you know what? So talk to us a little bit about um, family and upbringing and uh, how you think that has molded you into the person you are today. My family was, my family is mm. very strict. We, my parents were very strict. My dad used to be quasi-perfectionist. So he was one of those guys who every Saturday morning you had a set number of tasks. Every Saturday, every weekend, mm. you had a set number of tasks to fulfill. And I remember on Saturday morning at 10 a.m., this used to be a Batman, the animation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The animation, the old one. The Saturday morning yes. cartoons. <laughs> yes. That one. So, my dad had tasks you had to fulfill every morning. Before and the clear. challenge was, if you took too long to do them, you would not make that. You would mm. not watch that cartoon. Mm. So, my challenge every morning was to wake up as early as possible. Go and buy the newspapers wash the car, polish my dad's shoes, clean the compound by the time that cartoon before came 10 a. M. Before 10 a.m. Make sure you're And yeah. to do it perfect. Yeah. Because yeah. if my dad found you sitting, <laughs> watching cartoons, and anything was out of order, Manya, you hadn't cleaned the boot of the car, or those we shoes were not time. shined properly, <laughs> or the compound is not clean enough, you would pluck you off your cartoons and you go and do them. So I carried it forward into my life. If I'm doing something, mm. I want to do it perfect, and I want to do it perfect the first time. So even when I'm in a game, if I'm cleaning out a rack, it has to be perfect. If you're scrummaging, it has to be perfect. If you are lifting in a line out, it has to be perfect. And then you work your way backwards. Like, how do you do that? Like, how do you play a game without putting a foot wrong for 80 minutes? You do not want, at the end of the game, to look back and say, ah, damn, I should have done that in training. Oh, damn, I should have done that. I should have done this. I should have done that. Like, I remember there was a time, I don't remember which league it was, but it was recent. We were playing Cobbs at Legends. And I was standing over a rack. It was in our 22, Ethan's rack. We were defending our try line. So I was standing over a rack. And I must have been off position. And Justin Shimono mm. noticed that. So he hit me off the rack. Imagine, Justin Shimono wow. hit me off the rack, <laughs> claimed the ball, series of plays, Cobb's cause, and we lose the game. So, I remember at that point in time, the, the reason why Justin noticed was because I was standing over the rack, and I noticed there was space on our blind. Mm. So, I was still 50-50, because also, I wanted the ball to go to the back to be cleared. Yeah. But also, my eye had noticed this space on the blind. So, I wanted to pick the ball, and at least carry it a few meters and get my teammates some more space mm. to clear the ball. So in that moment of hesitation, Justin checked the rack and turned over the ball. So when I'm in a rack, I want to do it perfectly. I don't want the opposition to get a 50-50 chance at turning over a rack because, oh, I was in a poor position or, oh, I was... Mm. juggling decisions. So yeah, that's where my upbringing comes in. Yeah, and this this part of growing up, you were in Kenya, right? Yes, I was in Kenya. So, yeah, tell us a little more about life in Kenya as a, a young lad growing up. Uh, there's not much happening. 
really, because my life in Kenya ended when I came, I can say, my first 20 years in Kenya, I was in school, basically. Mm. So my adult life outside my parents' home started when I came to Uganda. So I can say I have spent 20 years sharp because around 2004, I came to campus in Uganda. I came to campus in August 2004. Mm. So to, from that point to this point, it's been exactly 20 years as an adult. Because okay. when you come to campus, basically, you're in your own. Mm, like, yeah. you're fully liable for all your actions. Anything you do, you can't go back running home and say, yeah. ah, guys, oh, I did this. You get the full extent. you be dealt with like an adult. Mm. So I can say when I came to campus, to date, 20 years, mm. adult. So back in Kenya, <clears throat> You can probably say I was a kid in my parents' home, uh, schooling, basically. There was nothing much I was doing, because as I said, we were pretty strict. So there was nothing much you could do outside that when I was any, growing up. Any particular cultural shock from your transition from Kenya to Uganda, when you came to Uganda? Yeah, I came to Uganda when I was coming for S5 mm. the first time. So we got to the border at around 6, 7 a.m. Mm. And my dad is like, ah, let's have breakfast. So I was like, how can he possibly want to take tea and bread in this place? Because there's a car taxi park that used to be at Busia. Oh, yeah. It was just an open field that time. Mm. So I was like, ah, where are we going to get tea and bread in this place? Because mm -hmm. I'm looking around, the shops are still closed. There's like one or two guys milling around their taxis. So we go and sit in a, in a small kiosk somewhere. And I'm looking around, I'm like, okay, what's going on? My mind is still taking everything in. And this lady comes and serves us food. Kneeling. <laughs> hey, like, someone is kneeling. I was like, I'm still trying to take that one in. Mm. Meanwhile, I've been given a hot plate of food. Ah, it was too much. Like, it was too much for me to take it. And I remember I was so tired, but the entire journey from Busia to Kampala, mm. I never slept. Actually, from Busia to school, I never slept. And then I remember we got to the old taxi park, and so I'm standing there, and my dad is like, let me go get some stuff, walk around, shop for some final, final things before we get into a taxi to go to the school. And I'm standing there, and I remember, you know, the infamous Kampala women, the way they used to dress, yeah. <laughs> walked in front of me uh. with a completely see-through dress. I was like, and it's broad daylight, because it takes four hours from Busia to Kampala. Uh -huh. This is so about 10, 10, 11 a.m. <laughs> I was not ready. <laughs> I was not ready. I was not that, ready for that. That was also around that time. I when, was not ready. When Buzz that. would only be in Kampala City. Hey, 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 hey. So she was probably that. coming from the bar. Yes. <laughs> I was not ready. <laughs> hey, it was midweek. It, it was, was like still. on a Thursday. Ugandans don't have a day. <laughs> they don't have a day. <laughs> still. Because the, 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 nearest, the nearest bar back then was like Capitol. No, Top. That's what no. I was going to say. Uh, William Street. was coming from Top Bar. It must have been. Ah, it top must bar. have been Top Bar, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the infamous William Street is just around there somewhere. Yeah. Ah, ah, I was not ready. Ah, interesting. There were so many things going on at the time. And I remember I was also standing next to someone who is buying and selling newspapers. And the infamous red paper was <laughs> right there. Uh, I'm looking at the newspaper. Haina. Haina. I'm like. Is this a newspaper? <laughs> is this a newspaper or a pornography magazine? <laughs> this is a pornography. This is not a newspaper. So as I go to school, then everyone is like having, what is it called, red paper mm. in school. And I think that was the thing that took me the longest to get used to. Mm. Red paper newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> mm? Took me a while to get used to that one. <laughs> um, mm. But anyway, um, so why rugby? I mean... 
you look like a, a pretty athletic person. You could have done a lot of things. You could have maybe played tennis. You could have played football. You could have uh, done anything. Why did you choose rugby? Or why did rugby choose you? I come from a very athletic family. Mm. My dad played hockey, football, squash. My mom played volleyball, netball. My sister played tennis. I was playing football. Mm. Uh, but it wasn't anything serious. You know that S village type of football. Mm. Were you a good defender? Striker. Striker? <laughs> Striker. Striker and goalkeeper. Striker and goalkeeper. That is wow. a weird, <laughs> <laughs> a weird transition. <laughs> Like, okay, it has changed. Now it has changed. And they put you in goal. Goal, yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. okay. But it was fun and games. It wasn't mm. anything serious. And then one day, this boy walks in with a rugby ball. Mm. And he's like, ah, this... Had you ever seen a rugby ball before Never. That I had no clue what rugby was. Mm. That was 1994. I was in P6. I had no clue Did what rugby was. Did you ask him why he was holding a popo? Huh? No, <laughs> you, like, okay, <laughs> I thought I knew something about American football, mm. yeah. but it wasn't anything serious because I wasn't even big on like proper sports back then. Mm. I would just go out for a run around with my friends and stuff. I wasn't really big on sports. So he walks in with a rugby ball and he's like, uh, this is rugby. I'm like, okay, uh, you get the ball. You have to run through your friends who are trying to stop you, and you have to score. Mm. Now, their goal is just an area. So you have to get the ball there. So I was like, okay. So after a few minutes, like a few minutes, literally a few minutes, Mm. I got the hang of it. So I remember, because I was chubby, not really chubby, but I was thick. I was heavy. I was a heavy boy. So I pretty much ran through. Putting you in goal as a goalkeeper. Mm. I couldn't <laughs> run. <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing as striker? <laughs> striker. Striker is easy. You don't really have to run much. You just have to just chill with the defenders, <laughs> get your run right, and someone puts the ball for you to pretty much hoof it into the net. So it pretty much ran through everyone, mm. got to the other side, but instead of putting the ball out, down, I just tossed it to the air. And the guy's like, hmm? Put, put it down. Like down. You have to put the ball down. And from that point on, I have never touched a soccer ball again in my life. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Um, but anyway, uh, we are enjoying Nile special here at uh, the Gardens, Nigeria. Um, Tuesdays are very special because it's a very, very scintillating and mind-tingling quiz, which I recommend everyone to try whenever they get the chance. But also it has a lot of space for you to have your... Um, your get-togethers, your private parties and a lot more, but even just um, a simple walk-in and just to enjoy a drink, just to enjoy something to eat, the Gardens Nigeria for all those around and for all those that can make it here, um, highly, highly recommended. Give it a try and let us know what you think. Uh, feedback is very, very important. But anyway, um, so uh, I think most of your serious rugby starts when you come to Uganda. Yes. No. Yes, so um, walk us a little bit through that. How did that experience start for someone who has come, experienced culture shock? How do you get into rugby? Was there any rugby culture shock as well? My rugby actually started at Muamba. Mm. The, the, how do you call it? The meet of senior rugby started in Muamba. Mm. And in school, uh, You'd be, we had some of the biggest forwards in Kenyan school rugby at the time. Uh, some of my alumni are uh, people like Derek Wamalwa, Polo Kech, um, Leslie Mango. Uh, all those are pretty heavy guys. So I remember Derek Wamalwa was almost knocking 110, 120 in all level. Mm. Yeah, so, Oliver. I was yeah. a big boy. Bruno, Bruno, what was your weight in Oliver, man? As light. I was even playing basketball. <laughs> <laughs> what position, Bruno? As a bad basketball player. What position? As a guard. You're a guard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there, there is no video evidence. We have nothing to do. 
carry on Mr. Scott. So, so we had big guys, but the funny thing is our coach emphasized a lot mm. on running rugby. So he wanted guys to look for space always. He hated having the traditional forward game. So our forwards were always running into space. Derek Omalwa actually won the Kenya Secondary School's sevens title mm. in 2000. Playing sevens for my school. So that just goes to show you how much we were running. Like we were running, we were silly fit. Boys could run 80 minutes without breaking a sweat. Wow. So I miss high school rugby, man. <laughs> we were stupid fit. Yeah, high school. So I believe high school rugby is where true fitness is yeah. before you discover you things. Will like never fight, you'll never be that like fit beer, in your life. Before you discover things like women. Mm. You'll never you be. just class, dining hall, field. beach. Now, that was it. My That's dome. Cool. My mm. dome was 15 steps from my bed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my dome, my mm. bed was 15 steps from the field. I counted. Mm. 15 steps from my bed to the field. So, and we used to train pretty much Monday to Sunday. Every day we were wow. training. Because I remember even every time we would go for holidays, my coach would be like, ah, you guys, now you're going to come back when you're fat. <laughs> and what was the break? Yeah. Three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys, you guys, three <laughs> weeks. <laughs> we would eat. That thing used to bother him. Because it was like we were starting from scratch. Okay. So when I transitioned to club rugby, mm. now that's where I found the traditional rugby. Mm. And uh, 2004 was, was, how do you call it? Hard. Because mm. I remember I collected so many injuries. Because I wasn't that big. I was big in school terms, but I was tiny in, for my position number one mm. in club terms. Because mm. I think that time I was knocking 90, bit, nine, the mid 90s. I was in the mid 90s, basically, 95, 97, 98 there. I wasn't that big, mm. but I was prop. Now you'd go into a game against KCB and I'm meeting Derek Omalo again. Derek Omala is 130 kilos. And he's loose head and I'm tight head. <laughs> and I remember every time we would engage, Derek would be like, ah, just collapse. Just, just let it go. Just fall. <laughs> just collapse. So, man, it was, it was hard. I remember I messed my back, my ankles. I was like, I was living, like a walking... And this is like when I'm, this is my first year. Mm. And I remember I actually missed the cut for the Kenyan, tra Kenyan 15s training in 2004, my first year, mm. because of injuries. Oh. So it was actually a bad year for me. And then when I came to Uganda, mm. now I thought, now I remember in 2004, yeah. there was Bamburi started in that year. Mm. So I remember uh, Cobbs, we played Heathens. Now I watched Cobbs play the weekend before, mm. and the next weekend we played Heathens. In which team were you? Mwamba. Okay. That time I was in Mwamba. Okay. So, so I when, when Bamburi had just started, yeah. you got into that whole setup of the Bamburi tournament yes. while still in Kenya? While still in Kenya. Okay. Okay. So I remember I... Well, which franchise were you playing for at the time? The one from Mwamba, I don't remember. It was Mwamba, KCB, blah, blah, blah. I don't remember mm. which one it was. So I remember the previous weekend, it was a Sunday. Yeah. The Ugandan team had played on Saturday. And then they played Bamburi on Sunday. Yeah. Mm. So I remember going to the field on Sunday at Impala. And Corbs was playing Impala. And then I watched Fred Mudola, the Vincento teams, mm. the Timothy Mudolas. The Victor Wadiers, I watched them play for the first time. I'd never met these fellows. I had mm. no clue who these guys were. Yeah. I was told they were Ugandans. I was like, hmm, okay. So I sat down and watched the game. And I remember watching Fred mm. with all his size mm. playing like a center. Fred? 
Fred Mudola playing at center playing like he was like a center oh. he was like a center his okay. running lines his ball handling skills his fitness his speed i swear you guys and he used to kick as well and he used to kick as well <laughs> so fred mudola at that time shocked me i was like this guy is a prop so i watched fred play in that game and remember they had played a full international of the day before yeah and he still had the gas of playing like oh, that yeah. the very next day mm. in still a senior game wow so i was mind blown so <laughs> the next weekend we played heathens now yeah yeah so uh that time i remember after the game uh i went i walked up to peter magona mm. and i was hey i'm coming to uganda in a few months time so i would like to join your team and i remember magona was like he was tired number one they had lost number two <laughs> so he wasn't in the talking mood yeah. and if you know magona magona is a very passionate guy yeah. so very passionate so he was like i don't even remember what he told me so i was like okay mm-hmm. anyway i'll talk to you when i get there mm-hmm. so uh when i came to uganda i remember one of my teammates came to my room to borrow my boots and I was like no I don't lend out my boots so he's like okay where are you going and he's like oh I'm going to Kampala rugby club and blah 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 I'm like where is that take me so we grab a taxi from Wandega all the way to Lugogo and we walk in and uh, we got in and I remember the Sharon Sharon was still Sharon was there yeah Sharon was there Sharon says are you going to change the other side so we walk into the changing room I change and i come out so i'm standing on the veranda of the for the old the changing rooms yeah so i'm standing there and i look onto the field so there's a slightly smaller team playing in front of the changing rooms and then i see the other side there are some big chaps I'm like ah those guys they're too big i can't go that side so let me enter these small chaps mm. first <laughs> so i enter the like small team running around running around running around that's how i joined cobs because the other side was pirates Mm. and this side was cobs okay. but i didn't know it me i thought ah, these small chaps must be like the team two or the other <laughs> <laughs> but which 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 names which which names in in heathens the team you played in the yeah. in, in kenya in bambuli which which names do you still remember on the heathens i remember besides uh, magona magona i remember roger sebina yeah. uh who else was was on that team mm. I don't remember much because you you hadn't interacted with them anyway yeah I hadn't interacted with them anyway yeah. that was the first time so now you you getting a taxi to from Wandegia to mm. what is now 500 shillings Kampa, yeah hmm? club 500 <laughs> 500 shillings all the way from Wandegia uh, <laughs> to Lugogo this will be 500 shillings yeah? uh had had I thought So you joined Cobs before that's how you joined Cobs That's how I joined. Cubs. Before you joined Impis or that Yeah, after? before I joined Impis. Oh, so how was your transition from now Cobs to Impis? Impis mm. was by default that I was on campus. Yeah, yeah. By default. So yeah. I remember some I remember 2005 mm. intervarsity in the East African intervarsity games. Mm. So like hey guys is it East African intervarsity teams come and train for Impis. Yeah. So by default you had to be there. We had to be there. So mm. all of us went and it was at KU Kenyatta University. Mm. So we got there and there was Jijo there was Baje there was Okech there was me there was Wells Stone there was Jijo the lawyer yeah. there's Jijo the eighth man mm. and there's Jijo the lawyer yeah. the guy who organized the 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 was his thing mm. yeah so we went there and yeah we performed as impis but uh we got there and there is the infamous East African derby the University of Nairobi versus Makerere University. Yeah. Ach. So I get there mm. and I step on the field and 
three quarters of the Kenya team <laughs> standing out for <laughs> University of Nairobi. Mm. I step on the field and I look at Kipto. I look at Namkos. Mm. I look at Sudi. <laughs> and I'm like, you guys, we are fucked. <laughs> <laughs> we are royally fucked. And mm. boss, those guys beat us, literally. I remember because the KU field was in a very open place. Yeah. Mm. So the wind was crazy. Yeah. And the ground was dry. And there were very little trees. So the wind was insane. Yeah. And I remember Alex, our fullback, our fly half then. I remember, I don't know if you guys remember him. Alex. No. There was some Kenyan called Alex. No. He was a DJ at Ground Zero. Moonlighting. He was also a DJ. This is the guy. <laughs> I actually, I, I actually went, went, to actually went to Ground Zero, but I don't yeah. remember DJ. <laughs> there was Alex, a Kenyan so. DJ called Alex. So Alex was our flyer for them. Mm. So Alex would try and kick. We would get a penalty somehow. Luckily, mm. we would get a penalty from the skin of our teeth. Alex would try to clear the ball. But the wind would, like, you'd see Alex really, really trying to kick for distance. But the wind, takes but the wind brings the ball back on the field. Mm. Oh. And who is under the ball? Who? Sudi. Oh. So Sudi runs into the middle of the field, barrels up the middle of the field, and because he has broken it right through the middle of the field, mm. so maybe he has a fullback to beat, and he sends a bullet across the field to his brother Namkos who is much, I would actually think Namkos was a better player than Sudi, who is more of a damager mm. than Sudi, who is because he's at the wing. So every time Alex would try and clear for touch, you would have to find Sudi in your five somehow. So it was, it was one hell of a game. Those were the times when I was on the receive. That was the first time I was on the receiving end of mm. Kenyan rugby as a Ugandan, okay. <laughs> and it actually took me a while mm. to come on top of Kenyan rugby for a very short window. But eh, it was it was insane. It was insane. Okay. Um, that's interesting. But there is one thing you mentioned, of course, uh, when you were talking about uh, when he alluded to transport from mm. uh, from Wandegia to Lugogo. Now, if we just break off a little bit from this whole rugby journey and just talk about some of the perceptions um, later on when you joined Heathens yes. at Chadondo, uh, we talked about um, some of the, the special, I want to call it a special relationship you had with some of those taxi guys <laughs> along that. <laughs> uh, uh, special relationship with them from the, the, the things we have been hearing, all the research we've tried to make from some of the old timers. And like guys, we do, that guy, uh, let's not take him. So, so this is a chance for you to tell us what the real story is. So the real story is this. Mm. So I remember uh, there used to be a bouncer mm. at Club Silk, yeah. the brown guy. I remember he died in the bomb blast. Oh, oh. yeah. So rest in peace. So that guy was the source of all my bad reputation <laughs> because <laughs> he would come from town. Uh. He would get a Makerere taxi because he used to work out at the Club 5 gym mm. in campus. Uh. So he would get a Makerere taxi and come into campus. Mm. And you know that roundabout, the first one, when you mm. enter campus. Mm. So he would, the taxi would stop there. So when the taxi stops there, that's the first taxi stop in campus. Yeah. Oh so yeah, the by taxi, the way, taxis yeah. used to be in university, yeah. inside. Taxis used to be inside. Inside, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They would be there. They would go all the way up to the... Outside area. the lecture calling. Go get the not young. They actually, they, they actually banned them when I was near one, like, same two. Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> so the taxi would stop and he would get out. I remember this one time I was sitting in the taxi when I was sitting up front. Mm -hmm. And the guy just basically walked out of the taxi put on his bag, he was a massive chap, put on his bag, looked at the conductor, and walked off. <laughs> so guys, might be mistaking him for me. And back then, I was a small chap. So I was seated in the taxi looking at this guy. He gets his bag. First of all, I was wondering, who the hell is this big guy? So I'm looking at him from behind. So in the taxi stops, and the guy just walks off. And the conductor is there standing looking at him. I was like, hmm. 
my mind made a mental note. So there was this one time also. Mm. There were taxis that used to come through one. I don't know where they were coming from. They would come through one day, yeah? mm -hmm. but they were not Bitano. Yes. So they had 2,000 or 1,000 or something. Mm. They were going to Buegere Chireka, blah, 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 yeah. blah, and all the banda. So me and Job made the mistake of climbing that taxi. Only in the wrong taxi. The wrong taxi. So wherever you get off, Regardless, regardless, it is 1K, it is 1K or 2K. Uh, so me and Job, Job Weko, uh, I think you remember Job Weko from the Cobb's days. Yeah. So me and Jobs have gotten into the taxi. We are also big by then. We have a Kamaso. Mm -hmm. We are not that big, but we have been working out for a while and stuff. Yeah, but Scott, at Heathens, you are... You no, this was when I was in Cobbs. This was when I was in Cobbs. I was still in Cobbs. Yeah. 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 Five, six. No, I wasn't that big yet. Okay. I wasn't that big. If you look at my pictures in Cobbs, I wasn't that big. So we've gotten onto the taxi. But compared to normal humans, yeah. we were big. Yeah. Yeah. Compared <laughs> to the average Uganda, we were big. So Ugandans are small. No, guys in Gulu, by the way, are big. But if you go to Gulu, mm. I'm small. If you go to Gulu, I'm small. I remember I would walk into bars in Gulu on random days, and everyone, like, this guy has probably never seen a gym in his life, mm. <laughs> never worked out in his life, mm. but the guy is like, those ends and he's big. Giant. Giant. If you go to Gulu, you go and hang out in Gulu, you see. You get like six guys of those and first put mm -hmm. them on a proper program. Or even guys from Arua. Yeah, yeah, Arua, those guys. This is Machiga, I like. Machiga shorts. So, uh, so, the taxi guy, I remember we get into a back and forth. Because you tell the guy we are getting off at Lugogo. Mm. And the guy, Moreze said it. Puts his hand back. <laughs> Me and Job give him 1,000 shillings. Stop. The guy loses his mind. He's like, ah, I need a sable. This, this is not the money that we need. We need like 4,000 shillings from both of you. <laughs> Me and Job look at the guy and they're like, Chief, what what are you high on? <laughs> it's 500 shillings from one day to, mm. to Lugogo. The guy's like, no, this is not from one day to Lugogo. As we are going on another route. Yeah. yeah. So me and Job, we were like, okay, we are basically fucked. So he said, Job's, Job, Job was much more cockier than me. Mm. Job is like, ah, we are not going to pay your money. I was <laughs> like, okay. Now the trouble starts. Because the conductor said, at that, in front of Ginger Road Police. Yeah. So there's that Katan when you're going down to Meme. Mm. Yeah. So the conductor tells the driver, these guys have refused to pay. Take them to Ginger Road Police. So the conductor goes and he just, like, he was in the inner lane. Yeah. Mm. So the inner lane. So he just stops and turns. And another taxi guy from behind comes and thwacks him from behind. <laughs> oh. So when the, the other driver knocks him from behind, he immediately jumped out and he came and he asked the, uh, the driver of our conductor or the driver of our taxi. Indicator you are. Indicator you are. You guy, you did not indicate. Mm. You did not indicate. So in our, this confusion, the conductor is concentrating on the other side. This guy is The driver is concentrating on the other side. I just grabbed the door open and yeah, jumped, jumped out in. and ran. <laughs> in the middle of Ginger Road, by the way. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how we survived. So, uh, I, so from that moment, uh, I don't know. It it never became like something I used to do intentionally. Mm. But if you get to a stage, mm. for example, I used to stay in Chiwatule those days. Oh. And from Ntinda to Chiwatule, yeah. was 300 shillings. Mm. Yeah. So you'd get to the stage late, like it's rush hour, and the guys have decided to hike, to hike the price mm. to 500. I'm like, like, uh, uh. <laughs> no. demo budget. That was not in my budget, number one. <laughs> I do not have the money, number two. Mm. I'm not paying that amount. So I remember me and my then girlfriend. So uh, so for us too, if it's normal rate, it's supposed to be 600 shillings. Mm -hmm. So for me alone, so for both of us, so when the guy would say, it's Vitano, Vitano, what, 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 what? And I would sit down, 
I remember, okay, I have some coins in my pocket. Yeah, I have a Vitano, but I don't have a 100 shilling coin. So the minute I would realize that I don't have a 100 shillings coin, I would turn to my girlfriend and say, do you have a 100 shillings coin? My girlfriend would say, Scott. Scott, 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 please do not get into a fight. <laughs> because she knew why I wanted the 100 shilling coin. 100, 100. 500 shillings, 600 shillings. Sharp. That's it. <laughs> That's it. No room no more. So my chick would be like, Scott, 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 just Which give those guys the money they want. <laughs> Do not get us into a fight. I'm like, ah, don't worry. Just give me the 100 shilling coin. <laughs> she would get to a pass, get me the chikumi, give it to me. So we'd get to the chuatle stage and the conductor would open the door. Mm. I'd make sure she gets out first. Because if I get out first, I might lock her inside. <laughs> I would be like, first get out. So after I get out, after she gets out, then I get out. Then I turn to the conductor and I give him his 600 shilling coin. The guy would look at the money. Then he looks at me. He would practically like, you can see like. <laughs> the money you can't handle. <laughs> then the taxi would be going. You tell the driver to get in there. So as he's closing the door and the taxi is driving off, the girl would pop his head out of the window and be like, Kuma Nyoko! Oh my God. That you guys have been the same since. You guys have seen days. It got to a point when Chiwatele taxis never wanted to carry me. So eventually they realized that I was 50 right I was 50% right. Mm. Because for me, I don't understand why. Because it's Russia, you have to hike the price. Mm. I don't understand. Mm. You tell me it's Bitano from permanent. I will pay you a Bitano. But don't tell me it's 300 now, 500 later. Ah, uh, uh, those ones, they've been quite mm. <laughs> You will give, you force other guys to. So eventually we became friends. Up to now, uh. we are still my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. How about, uh, how about the, the Chadondo um, theft story? They said you were one of the, in quotes, disciplinarians in that regard. But I think you were also part of management then. Yeah, I was part mm. of management yeah. then. How long were you in management at Chadondo? I managed Chadondo from February 2008 mm. to around 2012. Mm. Yeah. Then I got into pay issue and I stepped down. Okay. Yeah. So that story of the theft, mm. I beg to differ. I was not alone and it happened Why once. Is it? Why is it you're the one that they are blaming? <laughs> <laughs> it happened once. Mm. So we catch a thief at Chadondo. And... Ah, they were, up to now, there are still many thieves. In fact, the other day, one of my workmates, mm. in all his wisdom, mm. decides to go to Chadondo, put his phones on the table, mm. and go to the toilet. Was he new to Uganda? <laughs> I told him, Chief, Kampala <laughs> CVZ. You can't, you can't do it you. at any other I actually, place. I actually asked him, how did they stick? Because I thought they had pickpocketed him or they had... Bang mm. a or something. The guy said, I put my phones on the table. Uh -huh. You can't do that in Kampala. Like you we send him even back the then, when I was a bouncer, good yeah. wishes. you could never do that. <laughs> you could never do that mistake, ever. Mm? So, mm. that time it happened once. So, you catch a thief, mm. put him into the shower. And of course, by then, the phone he had stolen and handed it over to someone, or had handed it over to someone. And it was probably in Nakawa by the time we were catching him. Mm. So we grab him and we are here trying to extract information out of him. <laughs> Nothing is coming out. So one of the guys that was within the showers mm. decides to come in with a log, literal log, mm. to beat him up. But so I look at him, I'm like, ah, you'll kill him, you'll kill him, you'll kill him. So the first blows land, boop, 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 beat, we were beating the living, and he was a brown guy. Mm. Ah. I swear, they beat Those this guy, properly. Mm. they beat this guy till he turned pink, everywhere. Wow. I'm saying from his toes, his legs, his back, his body, his arms, face, have you seen everything that, have was red. Have you seen red. that meme where they give the guy like 
You can energy drink where they are drinking. <laughs> I think you, you, you guys are part no. of that arrangement. Now, let me tell you what happened. <laughs> yeah. So we beat this guy. Nothing is forthcoming. Ooh. I think he was like, uh, these are amateurs. Because, you know, it reaches a point when you're being beaten, when mm. if people are not throwing the right punches, mm. they're pretty much caressing you. Yeah. So, and I think someone decided to step out because guys were tired yeah. of beating him. <laughs> he was <laughs> naked, tired. by the way, at that point. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so someone decided to step out. So he opened the bathroom door and he stepped out. Chief, we blinked like this. That guy shot out of that shower like a bullet. Back naked, by the way. <laughs> they hadn't fenced the trench. Yeah. So he just shot out of the shower, right through the crowd, into the channel, and vanished. After all, Adam never walked loads, so <laughs> who is he? Chad, that was a ah, serious Chad, Chad, the thing with Chadondo was at that time, Chadondo was pretty dangerous. Mm. Very dangerous. You'd be searching people random and you'd find them with knives. And I remember the weapon that I feared the most was the screwdriver. Mm. Mm. So a guy would take a, the big screwdriver, the full length one, mm. and then he'd file it to a needle point. Yes. And so what you do, uh, they would wear their, their jeans, so they would poke a hole in the, yeah. poke, in the jean. So the, so the thing would hang yeah. inside. So inside, you just get the, the knob. The knob. Yeah. So the knob hangs the screwdriver to everything. Other thing used to scare the living daylights out of me. Every time you'd, and you, and Chadondo is the first place where I would actually have to pat people down up to the socks, everywhere. If you don't, someone is inside with a weapon. Ah, I nearly got my leg shot off. Really? At Shadondo, yeah. And it was the Friday night. The next day we were playing Cobbs events. Ah. Hmm? Anyway, um, back to the rugby. Hmm. So, at what club did you first win your local um, championship in Uganda? Cobbs. Cobbs. Yeah. With the small, the guys you had conceived to be the small guys. Uh, yes. You were, was it in the first season you had just joined them? Ah, the How was it easy getting into the Cobbs setup? The Cobbs setup that time, the, the Ronnie Lula, Luta Gomez, mm. uh, of course the Fred, the Park, blah, blah, blah. Mm. But the Park was huge. Mm. The Roger Rukundos. Uh, I know many of those guys, they are Timothy pretty Mudola. Uh, proud individuals. So No, they were not very proud, actually. Mm. They were bloody passionate, number passionate, one. Passionate, yes. Mm. Number two, the pa entire pack from number one mm. to number eight, everyone had insane skills. Now, let me give you, for example, mm. you had a lock pairing of Wadia and... Uh, and who? Who was the other lock? I don't remember who the other lock was. But you could not displace any of them. Mm. Mm. And then back row, you had Roger Rukundo at eight. You had Timothy Mudola at flank. Mm. And then you had the undertaker on the other flank. Tell me, who are you going to this place? <laughs> then bro. You, you remember that point you were still a I was still like a small guy. Uh. Bro, you're yeah, afraid way, Mudola. I, I, I failed to, to really get it into my head that, uh, that Scott's first position was bro. <laughs> 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 uh. yeah. so, so where did you fit into that, that, that puzzle? So the thing was, I had good hands. Mm. I had some car speed. Not too much. I had some car speed. So the guys were like, ah, since you have good hands, uh, go and fit somewhere in the back line. Mm. Because I could not displace anyone in that park. Yeah. Impossible. It was impossible. Where was I going to go? Mm -hmm. If I was to, to, to stay in the park, I was going to be on the bench. Mm. Mm. But they needed my, me on the field. Because number one, I was biggish. Mm. I had good hands mm. and I could run. So the guys were like, ah, I think you should play center. So okay. they pushed me to 12. Mm. So my first position in Uganda was actually 12. 12. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. I played 12 for a full year. For a full year. That was 2005. I played 12. What's your favorite position, though, out of all the positions you've played? I would have to say six. Six. Six is still the Why? Best. Why six? 
Seven. Mm. Seven, you are basically a back row. You're in the backs mm. the entire time. Seven, you're always roaming in the backs. Mm. There's very little. The forwards will probably see very little of you. Mm. Eight. Eight, I have to say, is my worst position. Not worst Why? as in I hate playing. I hate it. I and hate you it. know you are iconic for the number eight position in this country along with people like Marvin Odong and whatnot. Isn't it also the, 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 the position that you've played most? Yes, it's a position I've played. So <laughs> why is it that eight is that position <coughs> you dread? Because eight, you have to do a lot of reading. Mm. You have to be pro, very proactive. Like, you have to read. Your energy mm. and mind. Your, actually, at eight, you think a lot. Mm. Because, number one, you have to... You can be like going in for a scrum and you notice, uh, let me say the defense had put two people on one side. Yeah. And you you see them shifting because they think the move is going to the, yes. the ball is going to the back line. So you have to be able to see things like that. You'll be standing <coughs> and you're like, mm, you see the one car guy going and you're like, mm. you see, is there enough space? And then you tell your scrum off, boss. Then the scrummer also has to tell the other winger, chief. <coughs> so you you mm. you are the you are the first person in so many plays, mm. and some of them might be risky. Yeah. Like for example, now that one, and the other give you the other case of the mm. the Cobbs game. Yeah. yeah. There are so many plays, and I'll give you also another case. Uh, we were playing the finals of the the national school setup in Kenya. Yeah. That was when I was in O level. And for some reason, I had been put at eight mm. for this one particular scrum. Mm. And we were playing Nakuru High and that in, the, in the finals. So we were going in and the entire Nakuru team, they were so focused on holding our pack. Yeah. So I noticed that the flankers were all... Like, you know, see, our pack was pretty heavy at that time. Mm. So the, all the Nakuru team was trying to focus on holding <coughs> our pack because we were hell-bent on shoving them back. But I do not know. They never, we never shoved them back. So these guys were all hell-bent on. So I remember, before I go in, I looked. There was space. There was literally no one on that. Because everyone was trying to cover the Lavin, Asegos, John Onyangos, our back row, our back line at that time, was pretty star-studded, mm. even in high school. So mm. everyone was trying to focus on covering those boys. Mm. So everyone had shifted that side. So I remember going down and thinking, pick that ball, pick that ball, go black, go go short side, pick that ball, go short side, and I didn't. So up to now, that still haunts me. Okay. So normally, I think of things like that. So up to now. When I'm going in for a play and I see the defense shifting in front of me, the situation is shifting in front of me, so I take risks. That's when I tell you, fuck it, let's go. Mm. And mm. I remember even like the last year when you were playing called yeah. Pirates, yeah. I remember we were, the game we lost to you guys at Chadondo. You lost to Mandawe at Chadia. Yeah, yeah. man, <laughs> So I remember there was a, we got a scrum in our five and Gamma was on at that time and Gamma wanted to pass the ball back to our flyer to clear yeah, yeah. the ball. Mm. And I told Gamma, you know what, fuck it, let's go. Let's just go. Is that Gamma the last is, minute play that, yes. you, that you guys wanted to milk yeah. either penalty or get yeah. something? No, that's, that's when we started in the five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I remember I asked Gamma, Gamma, let's go. So Gamma looks at the fly half, and then he looked at me. And he said, let's go. I said, Kawa. So he puts a ball in, I pick, run, give it to the flyer, the winger, gain some ground, and that's when I started the PDs, PDs, yeah, yeah, PDs, yeah. PDs. Yeah. Then there was a knock on someone, the game ended. Yeah. Ah. yeah, so that's where my mantra now comes in. Mm. So eight is my most hated position because you have to take risks, read, think, 
man, eight is too much. Just for you, you just want to tackle and live your best life. Hey, man. Six, you do not have a job description on that field. Six, if the ball is yours, you have some breathing space. Like, mm -hmm. you just follow plays, hit tracks, do this, do that, carry the ball forward a few times. But now the job of number six mm. comes in when the opponents have the ball. Yeah. So now when the opponents have the ball, now your job is number one, hit trucks, yeah. disturb, destabilize their racks, look for their big men who are carrying the ball and pre practically subdue mm. their big men. Seven, now seven's job is to read and run, backline. He's always plugging holes in the back line, cross-covering the back line. So seven is quite a bit of work. So I, six is my favorite. How many positions have you played uh, out of the 15? 12, 13. All positions except wing, fly, scrum off, hook. Full back. Full back? Full back, yeah. Those five. And hook? Yeah. Hook I have. You have played hook? I've played hook. <laughs> Commonwealth Games. Oh. Commonwealth Games was the shortest guy. <laughs> so imagine you have a prop pairing. Are those of, the games in India? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you have a prop pairing of Matthias and Timothy Mundol. Wow. And both of them are like here. Yeah. Who is the natural hooker? <laughs> it was so, me and... Um, talking about phone memories, um, from all those... Uh, I think from my understanding, you have played for six clubs locally. In Uganda. Six. That is Impis, that is Pirates, that is Cobs, that is Evens, that is Rhinos. <clears throat> Something's missing. Five, right? Yeah, five. Five or six. They yeah. should be Evens, Cobs, Rhinos, Pirates, Impis. They are five. Yeah, they're five. Then uh, you have played for Mwamba and Harlequins. Yes. And in a few seconds from each, what's your fondest memory from each? From each? Yeah. Pirates has to be that bomb squad, mm. that Uganda Cup. Yeah. And then you have Solo at Solo, Solomon Mawanda. Mm. God bless his soul. I think Solo was one of Uganda's most underrated hookers. Yeah. It was beautiful playing with that team. Uh, Cobbs was... Uh, playing with Timothy Mudola, mm -hmm. then uh, the fly half, what was his name? Edmund. Edmund, yeah. Roger Rukundo, Fred Mudola. Playing with those guys, it was... Was Alan Masiko in that team? Well? Alan Masiko yeah. was in that. Alan had just come in. Because okay. mm. I remember Alan came in and I'd left, I was leaving at the time. So oh. I played about one season with him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so playing with those guys and the fluidity of their rugby. Like, it was almost, everyone was on sync. The entire Hobbs and team. Flair. Like, you do not need mm. to know, you do not even need to be told what the other player wants to do. Because mm. you'd have people like Simon Wakabi on that team, and mm. yeah. Alan, then you'd have Isaac, the, what is his name? Isaac, the, Isaac Lutuama. Lutuama yeah. So those are guys who you knew, if you made a break, Either three of those guys would be around you somewhere because they were that quick. Like, if you just, as soon as you made a break, one, two, three steps, Alan Musoki was screaming on your ear. If Alan carried the ball, Wakabi was on his shoulder. Mm. So it was telepathic. Like, if you made a break, Alan, you would hear Alan within seconds. Like, you didn't have to and look for him. Mm. But uh, yeah. th there's a time I talked, to, I think it was Lutia and, and o o Omona, Bobman. Mm. Yeah. And they were talking about how back then in the Cobbs team, you actually had to fight for your number. I because any, any, any mistake, there would be another perfect replacement or even an injury. Coming back from an injury, it would be hard. You would find uh, your number yeah, gone, yeah, yeah. like current spring box. <laughs> Man, that team, that team, and whoever stepped in mm. would gel immediately. Mm. Like, you'll not find someone having teething problems, playing a position. Mm. Like, guys would just, like, everyone knew what to do. Like, if you were going in for a game with that Cobbs team, mm. it was business. Like, you'd step on the field, and there was very little 
like Edmond would say, I'm doing this, and somehow, okay, I don't know, I wasn't in the back line at that time, yeah. but somehow, you would see, like, the, these guys are not talking. Mm. Like, you just lift your head up, Edmond is doing this, Alan is doing that, Stone is doing this, that guy is doing this, and you see, like, no one is talking. And I think their mantra, poetry in motion, that was the personification of that. Because mm. even us on field, like, they would be doing things and we'd be like, it was yes, like we were watching, like, like we had fans. front seats, mm. yeah. like we had front seats to the action, like we were sitting in a movie. Mm. So then Rhinos, Rhinos was being able to work with people like Matthias again, mm. and uh, how do you call it? Rhinos, Rhinos, Rhinos was how we managed to cobble up com complete strangers. Yeah. Like players who had never played with each other before. Mm -hmm. A team that was patched up. Like it was like this guy has come from their side, that guy has come from their side. It's like you playing a festival side every weekend. Yeah. Like you just gather up a group of people mm -hmm. and you decide, hey, we are playing a game this weekend. So the entire, the, my entirety, the first years in Rhinos was making those players gel. Mm. And then also working with Mukama, m m sorry, Brian. Makalama. Makalama yeah. as a coach. Uh, that, that season was particularly special because uh, um, uh, Rhinos found themselves in a position where they are all, they are gunning for the title. Yeah. Yeah. But unfortunately, they met a very stubborn pirate side that was also <laughs> its... Mm -mm. It wasn't was pirates. It was heathens. It was heathens. It was heathens. It was heathens. Which team did, uh, did, uh, uh, did rhinos lose to to bottle that? Heathens. It was heathens. Yes. That was we, the game, I think. So it was, it was pirates it was the next pirates. season. I, I, I can remember it was like pirates was even mm -hmm. a 3-0 game. Pirates was not... A, the game that lost us the title mm. was heathens at Legends. Yes, but then who won the title that season? Was it the Pirates? No, it was Heathens. I think it was. Anyway. It was Heathens. No, it was Maybe Heathens. we are getting it a bit. It confused, was Heathens. Because I remember uh, Makalama asked me, mm. uh, do, you get, do you think that time Philip was around? Mm. And he asked me, do you think Philip is going to play? Philip, I remember, either he had just come from injury mm. or something. He had broken his leg again. Mm. Yeah. So you were like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and then, I remember that was the time he put Oketayot on the wing. Mm. And Oketayot was facing Wokos at 13. Mm. And uh, Sebuliba. Sebuliba on the wing. Mm. And those two. And I remember I told guys, that is a, those are the people who are going to disturb us. Mm. Because I think by then also, you had every club had lost the to park. Us. Had lost the, had lost its path to rhinos. Yes, they had, they had, they had banged every other, every other. Everyone, park. imagine Marshall. the famous <laughs> advert <laughs> that was made from from that rhinos yeah. versus Cobb's park. Oh man, that park was insane. Was I remember park. playing at eight behind those guys. Mm. It was solid, and I remember telling them before that heathens came, those two guys are going to be our problem. Mm. So Alan, all, I mean Brian also tried to contain them by putting, uh, what's his name, mm, put, putting Oketayot Byron. on the wing. But eh, those guys combined I think for like three tries, four, three, four. That was the end of our title. So what led to the disbandment of that collection of players? Because I feel like if they had stayed together for about one three, more four season. years... Even one more season, mm. stuff could have happened. What what started going wrong was Makalama losing his coaching. Because mm. yeah. Makalama commanded a lot of respect yeah. from players. Yeah, yeah. So when Makalama stepped on the field, it was business. Mm. Like the park was focused. He would look over, and the back line was focused and. Everyone sort of respected Makalama on the team. Yeah. So when Makalama stepped away, 
that focus sort of dimmed. Because I remember who came in. Is it John? John. John, John. Yeah, that must have been John Musoke. John Musoke came in. But John didn't command the same amount of respect as Makalam. Okay. Yeah. So that is where the decline of that rhino steam went. But yeah. right now I'm seeing they are coming back up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they are they are really doing well. They're really gunning. Because you can't you can't you can't do a an unbeaten of five and you're a small boy. No, 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 no. What was it about your, your stint at Harlequin? Harlequin going back to Kenya after playing for a while in Uganda. No, when I went my original intention of going back to Harlequins was to go back to Kenya. Mm. Yeah. So I thought let me go finish like a couple of years in Kenya. And then when I got to Harlequins, uh, Harlequins, it was hard breaking into the setup. Because mm. these are players the coaches had worked with, the coaches knew. And uh, one thing about Kenyan forward play is Kenyan forward play is pretty structured. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, me coming from a place in Uganda where you pretty much have to make plays on the fly. You get like, oh, you'll you'll train structure in training. Like, oh, we are going to have true knocks here, blah blah blah. But when it comes to game time, everything is pretty much instinct. You yeah. get. So when I went to Queens, I went with my, how do you call it? I went with my happy-go-lucky mm. running. I would tell guys, hey, let's do an 89 here. Mm. And the guys, would, the scrummer would look at me like, Chief, <laughs> we don't do that thing here. The ball comes from the eighth man to the fly half and blah, blah. I'd be like, there's literally no one down that wing. Let's use that wing. I remember one time I tried an 89 and the scrummer froze in his place. He was like, hey, what is this guy doing? Ah... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Queens, Queens is pretty much structured. Mm. I remember going for the preseason, and you guys, Kenyan yeah, well, club rugby mm. is is somewhere else. You have a, a, a pretty quiet and uh, let me say reserved demeanor, where most of the times you don't smile. Uh, amongst the the rugby circles, at least, it's very surprising to see you. Uh, engaging with so many people or smiling a lot. Is this something you do to try and create fear among the people or is this just your style? Is that just who you are? That's just who I am. Mm. I do not, like, I don't know how to say it, but sometimes in crowds, I feel like too much attention. Yeah. Mm. So I'm, I'm not still used to that so there are times when you're out into people and everyone is like oh that's god oh that's god oh. I'm like ah. <laughs> ah i don't okay. really <laughs> that's interesting um looking at your international career um would you say that you really achieved everything that you wanted to achieve on in test rugby i feel i didn't play long enough mm. yeah I feel I didn't play long enough. According to us, that's guy you have 27 caps. Yeah, I feel like I should have started earlier. Because mm. mm. I remember I got my first cup at 27. Yeah, 2009, I was 27. Was was that because of the competition of numbers in while for the time you were still in Kenya? Mm, oh, no, actually what scattered my, what scuppled my Kenyan, Kenyan career was the fact that I was here for campus. So every time I would try to go back home, everyone would be like, ah, no one knows how you're playing. Mm. No one has watched you. So it was, it was, it was, it was quite hard getting into the Kenyan setup. So I feel I lost quite a bit of time. Mm. Uh, I lost quite a bit of time uh, when I was trying to get into the Kenyan setup. Because what, that was how many years? 2004, 5, 6, 7. That was four years. Okay, but yeah. how now? How 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 easy was it transition now? 
to playing test rugby for for the national team of Uganda. Yet it was he also not, had yeah. had had a belonging the other side across. So when uh, first of all, I had to wait three years mm. to be to transition from Kenyan call up to Ugandan call up. Yeah, yeah. So that also took time. Okay. And then I remember I trained with a squad that won the Africa Cup mm. in 2007. And I remember being dropped from that squad. I remember they called out the list on the opening day yeah. of the World Cup, mm. the Rugby World Cup yeah. at Legends. And I remember being dropped from that squad. And I remember walking out of Legends crying. Mm. Yeah, it's hurt. That one hurt. Because I was like, oh, I'm being dropped from the Kenyan side. Now I've come this side, I'm being dropped again. Ah. So then Ramsey is the one who pulled me aside and told me, no, it's not like that. You see, you have to like do it a certain way. You have to wait for three years to transition from being in the Kenyan setup to the Ugandan setup. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh, give me the forms. So Ramsey gave me the forms. I signed officially mm-hmm. to play for Uganda in 2007. So I had to wait three years more. So that was a total of how many years? Seven years. Seven years. That was quite Just some time, yeah. Playing around Kenyan rugby. Then I come back to the side. Then I'm still I'm running around Ugandan rugby. By the time I was legally allowed to play for you. So I wasted. I feel I should have played some more. Mm. Would that frustration yeah, be the reason you also journeyed around clubs as well? No, actually, my journey around clubs was to do with playing with certain players. Mm. You get so I would look the other side and I would, because I have a lot of friends amongst players, actually. Mm. My rivalry my rivalry with players ends on the pitch. On the on field. The pitch. Outside the field, I will give advice, I will talk. I will I talk with players and a lot. Yeah. I actually talk with players a lot. Whatever club you come from, you come to me for advice. I remember I pulled Marvin from Pirates. That time Marvin was in Pirates. Mm. I think Marvin was my biggest rival in club rugby oh. but i pulled marvin from pirates and took him to my gym took chimono from Cobbs, took him to my gym mm. even up to now i still talk to players i still try to bring people to my to work out i still give advice and stuff so my journey around clubs is mostly around playing with certain guys because a guy will tell me ah scott why don't you come to pirates like i remember that was who told me that kichwa that was the time the Kichos were in Pirates. So the Kichos were like, ask what you come, 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 come. So I was like, hmm, this makes sense. Yeah. So I crossed over to Pirates. And I remember Rhinos, it was John Musoke's brother. Mm. What is Henry. His Henry. Mm. Henry Musoke. One day we were, that day Kenya beat us. At Legends, what was it, 2016? Mm. I don't know how many. The time when Kevin had to tackle the eighth man who just ran through the entire park. Yeah. That game. So after that game, Andrew's like, why don't you come to Rhinos? And told me I was doing something big, We've got a new sponsor, and blah, blah, blah. I was like, mm. so I asked him, who is the coach? He said, Makalama will be our coach. I'm like, I'm sold. I'm coming. You didn't have any. Uh fears about any backlash because in Uganda we have this sentiment about uh, uh, rugby clubs and how so much sentiment or so much feelings attached to that club so when you leave that club there's that feeling of being a traitor or something of that sort so you never really cared no. about that no I never had that why because I came to Uganda without any attachment okay. mm. like I'm not attached to any school the school I went to was pretty much rugby-less. Mm. Bukema. No one gave a damn about rugby. Mm. So when I came into club rugby, I still wasn't attached. Yeah. The only club that I really, really felt attached to was Mwamba. Mm. And I think up to now, I remember one Mwamba official asking me, so when you're all this thinking about going to a club and you landed at Harlequins, actually it was... This lady, this lady in 
Eunice. Eunice. Because I know she's very Eunice. passionate about Mwamba. Yeah, Eunice looked at me. I remember it was a game. It was Harlequins Impala mm. at Impala. Yeah. Mm. And Eunice looked at me in Queen's kit. And Eunice was like, Scott, really? Really? In all this, you trying to come back to Kenya, you didn't think of Mwamba. Yet it made you. Pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> so it hit me hard. <laughs> that that hit me hard. I remember looking at Eunice and I was like, I didn't have a comment for that. I didn't have a comment for um, that. Um what's your best moment in test rugby? My best moment in test rugby. My first game. Your first game? Yeah. Which one your was your debut? That? My against debut. Tunisia. Tunisia. Oh Tunisia. Where you played at thirteen. Thirteen. <laughs> yeah. And the best moment would be, I remember I was standing next to the park. Mm. And so the idea was to give me the ball. I crash, rock over, then the ball goes 10, 12, blah, 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 mm. blah, blah, blah. So I remember looking in front of me and my opponent had squared right in front of me. So I looked at him and I was like, okay. I think there's a gap here. So I was like, if this Kramov can get this ball to me quickly, before those flankers get out of that park, yeah. there's a gap here. Because <laughs> the, the flyer was not a big guy. So I was like, I think I can run through this gap. So I just need to shake this guy a bit. Mm. So luckily enough, the Kramov whipped the ball out quickly. I grabbed it and I drifted like I was going out. Yeah. So the fly half stepped with me and I stepped back in. So when I stepped back in, the flankers were, I think one flanker had shot out, like he was going out into the back line. The eighth man was still stuck behind the park. And I caught this gap, that small window. And I remember I got to the, and I stepped back in, sort of curved around behind the park and like went for the corner flag. So I remember, I remember the full back trying standing in front of me trying to tackle me but he was too low and he was already to my side so i looked at him and i was like ah so i was looking at the corner flag so i was like ah mm. i remember looking at the try line and i was like nah no one is going to stop me at this point <laughs> and i remember that moment up to today yeah. but it was a funny uh, score getting into, yeah it was a funny it's score getting into that 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 uh, getting your debut after so many points yes, of rejection yeah. from kenya then the chaos with uh, switching to Uganda. Yeah. How did uh, that call up or that first game happen for you? The first game. So I remember I was at Legends. Yeah. Uh, Nondis had come for a trial game with the Uganda team. And I was just chilling at Legends. And I remember. Um, I remember someone walking to me and like, ah, Chester Williams wants to see you. I'm like, guy, 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 please. I looked at him. Mm. And, uh, so the guy, and this is Chester Williams. We like, I practically grew up watching Chester Williams mm. in the 1995 World Cup. Yeah. So I remember looking at him, I'm like, so I was like, guy, I'm serious. Chester wants to see you. Mm. And I remember I was just coming from an injury. It's like a four-month injury or something. So I'm like, ah, guy, please don't play around with me. Mm. He's like, boss, I'm dead serious. Chester wants to see you. I'm like, guy, if you're pulling my leg, I will have your nuts for supper. <laughs> so the guy is like, no, Scott, I'm dead serious. Chester wants to see you. So I was like, okay. So I walk across to Chadondo. So Chester mm. was sitting upstairs. So I woke up, I walk in, I go up to, and he's like, ah. So I greeted Chester, and I looked at him, and I'm like, I remember, like, I was buzzing. Like, mm. this is someone you watched play a World Cup, and you're here shaking his hand. And I'm like, uh, so he's like, hey, so here you play center. You play center. I'm like, not exactly, but yes, I played center. So the guy's like, yes. So what is the problem? What what problem do you have? I'm like, I'm just coming from an injury. Blah. We had just played the Toyota Sevens the weekend before. Yeah. So that was like my test. Like 
to see if I was okay and everything. I remember I still had strapping my knee and stuff. So he's like, ah, so what is the problem? I told him, I think I did something. And he's like, ah, that's nothing. You can run, you've played. You're here, you played sevens last weekend. I was like, yes, I played sevens. So he's like, ah, then you're okay. We'll strap you. So I want you to play for me. And my friend, if Chester asks you to do something, you have to show up. You have to show up. Please. You have no excuse. So I remember Chester telling me, oh, I want you to play for me. So I thought Chester was going to tell me, ah, play park, play flank, play blah, 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 blah. He's like, nope. Center. You're putting number 13. <laughs> so I remember that next week, mm. that next weekend we were playing Nondis. And I was so out of place, but every time, because I remember the Nondis guys, they realized they have someone in the line who doesn't play in the line. Mm. So I remember standing at 13 and having a, mm. a Kenyan fly, Nondis flyer streaking straight for me. And I have the my opposite number also streaking straight for me. So I'm like, who do I tap? And you know the Kenyans run mm. in the back line. So it was either put your shoulder this side, hit the fly half, or put mm. the shoulder here and hit the 12. But if you put the shoulder here and hit the 12, the fly half goes through. If you put your shoulder here and hit the fly half, the center runs. Through. So it was, it was, and not that I'd not played 12, but it was, mm. how do you call it? It was, it was quite a rude awakening. It's like, it's no problem. You, you can handle so that's how I got my first cup. Chester asked me to play 13. Who am I to say no? So Toughest test rugby game or test rugby opposition you faced? It's Kenya, hands down. Kenya. Kenya. Kenya is hard. Okay. Yeah, Kenya is hard. And every time for some reason you are playing against Kenya, I I don't know if it's particular they are looking for me. <laughs> or, I've never understood that thing. But for some reason, every time I play Kenya, I cannot perform like I want to perform. Like I feel like this game is too hard. These guys are tackling too hard. These guys, I can't run through people. Like Kenya is hard. I remember there was a time we were playing Kenya at Chadondo and Brian Nyukuli, mm. the captain back then. So I had banged some of my things, things. So I tried to go and score. Mm. And Nikuli would always turn up. Either he's tackling me, the 22, tackling me on the 5, tackling me on the try line or stuff. And like me and Nikuli are, are really good friends. Like mm. really, really good friends. So Nikuli would tap me on the back after. He's like, Scott, man, you can't score against Kenya. Not you. Someone else. Not you. Not you. Not you. Not you. Uh, mm. And it, it happens to be the country that you played most best against. Yes. Yeah, so it's normally Kenya is my biggest game. Yeah. Kenya is my biggest game. Would you would you consider going back to play for the rugby cranes? Yes, I would actually consider going back to play. I I wanted to last year, mm. but I just it's got in a new job, yeah. so that took me out of the equation. And then, because this new job you'd finish working at six, and then you have to come across town because I'm right slap bang in the middle of town, so I have to cross all the way from Akesha Avenue to Kings Park, Burger. So uh, I was like, I, uh, I'm out. It was tough. It was and tough. I think yeah. you would have enjoyed Tunisia. I would have it must, enjoyed it. It must have been funny because um, the first game, of course, boys showed up. But in the second game, after the game, we got so, I was there. Mm. So we got so many injuries. And I remember on the last game, on the last test game in Tunisia, uh, Musava, who was, who was retired, and had gone as as part of the technical <laughs> team. He had to jump on and he had to suffer. Uh, something about old players. Yeah. Even like seeing Wakabi turn up this weekend. Yeah. It's always a joy to watch them come back. Gamma. Like, yeah. Gamma is still playing. Yeah. yeah. Wakabi coming back was very special because I have played with Wakabi and I know what Wakabi can do when Wakabi Such turns up. So. Player. It must have been a handful for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> it was I quite... I know uh, what his, could be his, well. his eyeball is still the same. Yeah. Um, and he, he told me a statement. He said, uh, my mind still wants to play. 
but the body can't. So let me stick to management and yes. the school's rugby programs I run in Entebbe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, I mean, the, we've also seen Tindi, Tabaruka. Yeah. The last Atheo season show for, for the Stallions. Yeah. <laughs> Atheo still plays. Atheo still plays. Yeah, who else? Uh, Adigas every once in a while. Yeah. Every once in a blue moon. But I don't know. I think this season he hasn't showed up yet. Yeah, even by the time Dale passed away, yeah. he, he was still he was. coming in and playing for the Sailors. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, anyway, um, that was also a good we, player. We start <laughs> yeah. to uh, wrap up. Um, there are a couple of things I want us to just address. Um, in a few um, seconds, I should say, for each of them, and then we see how to uh, go about this. But anyway. Yeah. Um, rugby today and rugby back then, comparisons, what do you, what's your take? Is there improvement? Has there been deterioration? What is the, what is the case from your point of view? I feel like rugby has stagnated. Stagnated? Yeah. Why? Like, I, like the rugby I played in Mwamba mm. in 2004, 5, 6, 7 as well. Remember, I think I played for a few games in 2007, and when I went back as part of Harlequins, yeah, there is a massive yeah. change, like in Kenyan rugby, mm. massive. Like the training is different. The the how do you call it? The training is different. The games are different. Mm. Like the plays are completely different. Yeah, yeah. So. Kenyan forwards back then used to be 50 50. Mm. Now, Kenyan forwards are insane. Like, I remember there's a game we played against Black Blood mm. as part of Queens. Black Blood, which is not like even the top team in Kenya. Mm. We played Black Blood, and Black Blood skinned Queens, the pack. Like, we bear, I think we even lost that game. Mm. So imagine if a team like Black Blood can scalp a team like Harlequins and you come to Ugandan rugby where it's still the traditional Cobbs events and maybe Pirates, not in a bad way, like maybe, okay, Pirates showing up. These days Pirates does show up, yeah. but back then it was Cobbs events. Mm. So you'd pretty much play a whole season and you'd only wait for, for the a Cobbs stuff. events game. Yeah. Mm. The entire season you're just slapping people left, right, 40-50, 40-50, 40-50. Mm. Then you get to this car, one game where you, it's tight. Like mm. you pretty much play two games in the entire season. Like compared to now, it's still Cobbs, Heathens, Pirates. Once you know, Blue Moon, like Rhinos will kill, disturb someone, Ginger Hippos is coming up as well. Even buffalo. Buffalo, buffaloes. <laughs> buffaloes. Yeah. Buffalo is a problem now. Yeah. Yeah. But the rugby, like tech I like technically, we are still playing the same rugby. Mm. Like in the forwards development, the forwards are still doing the forwards are massively skilled. Yeah. I'm not going to take anything away from them. But you feel like Ugandan forwards can do something extra. Like you they need to be supported they need to be boosted to do something extra but it is not there's something missing in that whole player development mm. sector like if you look at schools rugby schools rugby everyone is pretty much training moves no one is training skills yeah so by this time these guys get into club rugby like you have to teach them everything afresh you okay. get like a player steps into the setup and rocking, scrummaging, like someone comes in from the school setup and doesn't know how to scrummage. Mm. I'm like, how? Huh? Rocking, running in with the ball. Everyone is running in with the ball like trees, like wardrobes. Like you go like that to Kenya, they will kill you. The, f the conditioning, the strength. Kenyan teams have two, three months SNC before season. Like, I'll give you an example of Cabras. Cabras practically works the whole year round. Wow. That's why they can... KCB works the whole year round. Yeah. Yeah. So, there's no break 
for those these guys. Then that also goes into the remuneration, how the players are paid now mm. in Kenya is completely different to how players are paid. Like in Kenya, an average player takes home about at least mm. 700,000 shillings. That's the least. That's basic pay. Like we're not even talking about the special players with their own arrangements and everything. Mm. I'm talking about this is basic pay in Kenya. So player remuneration has stayed the same. It hasn't changed. So there's still a lot to be Which done. Which goes into um, what I wanted to ask about um, Ivan Magomo's recent posts about yeah. image rights and welfare of players. What's your take on that? You, who are, the person who has also been very big on being paid what you're worth, what's your take? Yes. I honestly think Ugandan rugby should take care of the players better. Mm. Like for now, for example, I'll compare with Kenyan rugby. Mm. All players in the entire league have health insurance. Medical insurance, mm. you get. We are not even talking about pay. Mm. Like, if you get injured in Kenyan drug, you are taken care of. There's nothing like, oh, let's wait, wait let's get money, let's have donations. Let No, you get injured today by Monday. You are in surgery or you're sorted. Mm. Huh? And that also helps in your recovery time. Here in Uganda, and I'll give examples of Marvin Odong. Marvin Odong didn't retire because he was done or that injury. No, Marvin Odong retired because of how he was taken care of. Justin also retired because of how he was taken care of. You get. So I honestly think we can, Uganda rugby can do much, much better in taking care of players. You will see when you go into an international game, yeah. Players cannot take more than two, three, four heavy hits. Mm. You get. You've given me an example of by the time guys were playing, there was a game where Alex Musava had to check him. Yeah. Like our, like there's so much our strength and conditioning has to improve, supplementation has to improve, feeding has to improve. Gym, 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 guys. Okay. Like there's so much that Ugandan rugby can do. I hope now that Mandela Stadium has been made. There's, we might have access to a gym facility there. Because I know Mandela has space for a gym, but there were no metals the last time I checked. Mm. So I hope they renovate that as well. So, it's um, Yeah, so uh, social media, um, do you think it has grown the game or not? Um, from a, pers- a person who has played in a time mm. when uh, social media wasn't a thing, up to this point where social media has a big impact, what on. do you think about it? Yeah, social media has grown, but if only you know how to use it. Mm. Get. Mm. Because it, uh, there's so much out there mm. that you can learn from. Yeah. So the social media is how you use it. Like uh, There was a time when Ugandan rugby games, were, I think they're still being streamed live, mm. which is a big improvement from our time. Yeah. When I think even UBC would not <laughs> show anything. You don't even have clips of you guys. There's no there. clips. We would have like one, two, three pictures, yeah. you playing a game, something. But now games are being streamed live. So that's a big improvement. And though it's a platform, I think it's still being underutilized. There's so much that we can use that can be used to reach more fans and grow the game. Because now, for example, I remember the time DSTV was streaming Ugandan games. Yeah. I think that's like the highlights of our social media back then. Now, do you enjoy do you enjoy the banter that is now among several rugby fans on the internet? Do you have have time to check them out? I check the banter, but it's normally how do I call it? I don't think it's. I don't know how to say it, mm. but sometimes you feel like everyone is missing. Okay. The, ma- the point. Um, okay. Like it should be constructive know. banter. Uh, not it has become people tearing each other down. To have yeah. Yeah. Was like as a you priority. should be able, to, like players should be able to say, oh, to make sure this and this is supposed to be happening, or this and this is and not happening. Or that. It should be constructive banter, okay. not yeah. just everyone. But the banter is good. Yeah. Banter is good. Good or bad, banter is good. Yeah. Okay. Um, mm. In mental health. 
uh, and it has become increasingly important to have people's mental health as a priority. Yeah. How do you take care of your mental health to make sure that you deliver both as a rugby player and even in your career? Ah, mental health. The problem with mental health is you first have to mm. experience the good and the bad part of it. Mm. Yeah, I can yeah. give you an example. There's a time I, I actually got depressed. Uh, I think about 2014, 2015. Mm. I was going through a very bad phase with the club I was playing for at that time. And, mm. yeah, I think immediately my contract ended. Like, I see pictures of myself in that time, yeah. and I literally don't recognize myself. Okay. Like, it was that bad. Like, uh, someone once pulled a picture of me in that, in about 2014, 2015, mm. and I looked at the picture and I was like, this is not me. Like, yeah. I don't recognize myself. Okay. I was at lost weight. I was ashy as fuck because I was wearing a short and my legs were ashy and I was standing in the middle of Legends Clubhouse and I don't recognize myself. Like even the clothes I was wearing at that time, I was like, what short was that? I don't know that short. So you have to go through it yourself. Yeah. Like literally pull yourself up from the, by the bootstraps because if you... And that's a sad bit about it. Like you have to go through all that yourself. No one really knows what rugby players go through. Mm. Yeah, it's it's hell because <laughs> some rugby players out there they are struggling a lot. Like I normally look at people I play with, and not everyone is doing well. You get no one, not everyone has a job, not everyone is being taken care of. Mm. Like there are times you even look at the money that the players are getting, and you're like, how does this guy manage to make it to training, to games? to feed, to dress. How? Like, it's crazy. All that weighs on a rugby player's mental a lot. Like, for example, if, if a guy is not feeding well, definitely you're not training well. Mm. You get. And if you're not feeding well, again, your mental is going to be shit going into a game. So Plus it will affect your work rate. It, it affects your work skills. rate. It affects everything. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it takes a lot. So there are times when... I'm also struggling, and you see a guy who is even deeper in the ditch than you coming to you for help, and you're like, hey, like how, how are you going to? So, but the good thing is, as a unit, rugby players really do look after themselves, look look, look out for themselves. Mm. I love the fact that um, every time a rugby player has an issue, players will chip in irrespective of, clubs, sides, and anything. Like, that's one thing that I really like. Mm. And it goes across across the board, in Kenya, in Uganda, anywhere. A player is having an issue. Guys will chip in. Like, regardless. Okay. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, passions that Scott enjoys besides rugby? Has to be traveling. Anything to do with cars, number one. Mm. Yeah. That's my first and foremost. Anything to do with cars, traveling. Yeah, that's my number one. Of course, working out, number two. Uh, watching TV, old movies. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you talked about cars, and <coughs> I'm forced to ask uh, Mercedes or Toyota. Ah, you guy. <laughs> now, uh, that one, uh, you know. Of course, Mercedes. Yeah. There is no arguing with a German. Yeah. Mercedes, BMW. I think across Audi, your, your day, career, you've gotten a number with of our small, small money. and awards. Which one yeah. really the Toyota holds? Or which one really <laughs> holds? <laughs> and then you love for oh, the vintage, vintage cars? Yeah. Toyota Classics have to take it. Okay. I think my favorite car right now is a Supra. The old one. Ah. The MK4. Not the new one. That's a BMW. I think across your, your career, you've gotten a number of accolades and awards. Which one really holds, or which ones really hold the most sentiment to you? The one that holds the most sentiment is the top try scorer. I won in the 2022 season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That one. Mm. Because I think that season, I was not really available for work for games, for training. 
So the amount of work that I put in on by myself was monstrous. Uh, I wasn't available for training because at the time I think I was driving uh, ambulances. Mm. So, and it was just when COVID was ebbing. It was still coming up, going down, coming up, going How down. How would you dis- describe and uh, Scott as I a couldn't make training. And Scott I wasn't able to make training a lot. It was actually the first season after COVID. Yeah, yeah. it was the first season. It was still COVID. It was still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so guys were just letting go, but let opening up, but COVID was still there. So it was quite, 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 quite something. Yeah. How would you dis- describe uh, Scott as a father and Scott as a partner? Scott as a father. No. Uh, I can say I'm not raising my kids the way my dad raised me. I'm pretty much an interactive guy. Mm-hmm. I'll give an example of there's a day my son got post. Yeah, yeah, I so, remember about that. Yeah. Yeah. So he just pretty much packed up a bag and walked out. And it was in COVID. Mm-hmm. Lockdown, everything. So eh, I made a few frantic calls and yeah, luckily, he was recovered soon after he had left home. Mm-hmm. So because so I go there and they listen back to us, so I couldn't stay long with him after that because I had to go to work and they had to get home before lockdown. Mm-hmm. So I said, uh, tomorrow I'll come. I'll come when because I didn't have work the next day. Mm-hmm. So the next day I go to see him. And if it was my dad, mm-hmm. He'd have beaten the skin off my bums. <laughs> so I remember we sat down with my son and yeah. I was talking to him and he was telling me his experiences and everything. Mm. So he was, he was, we were, I was pretty much laughing at him. Mm. So he was telling mm. me, ah, they put, they made me sleep in the sofas behind the, the desk, the desk, what do you call it? So count, to uh, close this, the, um, um, let's OB just go through a couple yeah. of the fans' so questions him sleep that there we and had. The sofas had uh, bad, ask them to put out if they had an blah, opportunity blah, blah. to ask. So we were laughing Scott, about it. Many of them are pretty yeah, much we, terrified. I'm of you. not. So, I'm pretty much yeah. laid back. Um, I try to. One was asking, um, "What yeah. is yeah. your leg day workout yeah. program so like?" Um, let's just go through a couple of the fans' questions that we had. Uh, ask them to put out if they had an opportunity to ask Scott, mm. many of them are pretty much terrified of you. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, they shouldn't, they shouldn't. One was asking, um, what is your leg day workout program like? My leg day workout, pretty much basics. Squats. Okay. Um, I do a lot of ankle Someone's work asking, will he ever retire from the game? Yeah, that's... Pretty much, where I see a lot of people have problems. Assume you're going to play up to mm. 200 years. Then I squats. Guess. Then pretty much, it's basic squats, hamstring. That's it. Hamstring. <laughs> Nothing much. It's pretty much a very basic workout. And deadlifts. Mm. Okay. Um, someone's asking, will he ever retire from the game? So much. People assume you're going to play up to 200 years. I guess. So you're looking at I see people like a few still playing. Uh, later on. So my friend, <laughs> why do you want me to retire when a few is still on the field? I would. I, would, I want to go into maybe player coach. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, that's something I'm looking at because I feel there's so much skill that I just don't want to leave the game what without What keeps you going strong up people. to date? So you're looking at perhaps being a coach uh, yeah. later on. Later on. I'm seeing Marshall is doing pretty well. Mm. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Marshall is doing pretty well. But for now, the mind and body are still okay. Yeah. Still very okay. <laughs> very, very okay. 100%. Good. God bless. Uh. <laughs> I thank God for protecting me all these years. What keeps you going strong up to date? Consistency, discipline, a hell of a lot of discipline. Yeah. That's what keeps me going. Especially about this, discipline. tell them about your 
it's a it's a hard thing to differentiate alcohol, especially beer from from rugby, whether players or fans. But you are one person that has never tasted alcohol in your life. Yeah. Uh, I do not know how I survived alcohol, to be honest, because alcohol has been around me ever since I pretty much started interacting with fellow men. Mm. In school, I remember when I went to Bugema. Bugema is in the middle of the Luero Triangle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, in Bugema, there is a lot of crude waraji. Yes. There is a lot. Like, I will tell you, I will tell you for a fact, that I think up to now, a Ruenzori bottle, this one, yeah. is 200 shillings. Kasese. Mm. Back then it was 200 shillings yeah. for a full bottle of Waraj. Mm. So then you come out of that and you get into MPs and Makerere and alcohol is still what all over the place yeah. and you finish that one. Then you come into proper adulthood and everyone around you is drinking. So I do not know how I survive drug alcohol. I do not know. This to be honest. indeed, yeah. Yeah. So then there is and working someone out, is asking, regardless, and regardless of what's happening. Like Why? I have to work out. Like I'll give you for a fact example. Like I'll play on Saturday. I will walk on Sunday. And I'll be in the gym on with squats on Monday. Without was the last time you shaved your beard? Come rain, come sunshine. Was it a full shave? Yeah. And someone is asking, can he shave his beard? No, I can't, unfortunately. Why? <laughs> because my face with my beard is on my ID, is on my passport. Okay. Is oh, basically those two. So, 2012. Was it a full shave? No, because I remember I stopped shaving in 2010, and then there was a Nile advert. That we took. Mm. It was for Uganda Cup. Yeah. So after that shoot, I never shaved mm. again. So 2010, 2011, 2012, I'm growing a pretty decent beard. So I go to the barber and I'm like, ah, I want you to shape it a bit. You having your beard, and the guy you know hashes it. With your beard, but <laughs> so I was like, fuck, now what am I going to do? So anyway, um, I tell him to, to like basically mm. cut it, like take it all off. Don't take it all off, but take it off. Dodging, so he uh, do, dodging it salon down fees a bit. And I think from 2012, I've never shaved again. That's 12 years. And hey. you just leave him alone. It's a signature look. What, what it is not a signature, uh, by the way. Uh, it is because mm. I got tired of shaving. Oh, <laughs> basic. I never intended to enter beard gang. I never intended to do any of that. I just got tired of shaving. I decided, you know what? I'm never shaving again. And I stopped. Thankfully, I came out looking nice. <laughs> what, what advice would you give to someone that would want, want to be like you? Ah, it's a lot of sacrifice. There's so much that I've sacrificed. Like... Mm. Even there's some sacrifices I'll go with to the grave. Okay. Like there's some stories I'll never. Yeah, and uh, that was a very, very insightful like, conversation. Amount of sacrifice has gone well into the dark. So made for rugby. I'm sure for pretty much the, the rest of this saying, conversation. I've missed out on so many family with moments. With a bit of uh, different I've missed out on it, so many. Uh, to just, but we had to make sure that these stories were told properly and told right. Of course, options, we do appreciate I've the fact that so uh, you also made the yeah. time to. Have a second chat okay. with us, despite the challenges that we yeah, had. And, uh, but, um, that was a very, very yeah, here at the Gardens Nigeria, enjoying a now special. Our partners, yeah. we do appreciate yeah, them, much, of course. Uh, the rest of this uh, with Bruno Akampa, and uh, any last of, words from you, Bruno, before we close? Graphic over it. Uh, yeah. to just, well, we had to make sure that this story is told properly and told right. Of course, we do appreciate the fact that uh, you also made the time to have a second chat with us, despite the challenges that we, we had. But. Um, yeah, here at the Gardens Nigeria enjoying a now special. Our partners, we do appreciate them, of course, uh, with Bruno Akampa. And uh, any last words from you, Bruno, before you close? Um, uh, maybe I would request for, I would request Scott to give advice to the mushrooming players. Uh, I know you feel that uh, Uganda rugby is now full of extremely talented young players yes 
hitting it both in the club and yeah. and, and at national level, and coming school. straight from school and making it now to the to the top flight team without going through the feeder club. Yeah. Um. I mean, you have you have some in your club. You have some you're playing against from other clubs yeah. who yeah. you notice how good they are. Yes. What advice would you give them as as they hope to grow their rugby careers? Uh, number one is keep grounded. Okay. Keep grounded. Don't let the fame, don't let the stardom get to you. Because now with social media, there's a lot of hype out there. Yes. Number two is pretty much stay hungry. Never ever lose that hunger. Never relax. Uh, never relent. Stay hungry. Like you win a title, you win a trophy, go for the next one. The same hunger. Like. That like show up I tell every you for day. a fact, the hunger I'm going with in this title is the same hunger I went with in my first title. Like never relent, never take your foot off the gas. Mm. Stay disciplined, stay consistent, learn your craft, keep learning, keep studying, always watch what everyone is doing, what the stars are doing, what the players, international players are doing. If you're watching a rugby game, don't just cheer because this team is winning and blah, blah, blah. Look at the guy in your position. What is he doing? Look at his footwork. Look at his tackling skills. Look at his ball carrying skills. Like, keep learning. It never stops. It never stops even for one bit. And if for some reason you get off the gravy train, mm. get back on it. Never ever, like if you lose a game, go back home, don't be pissed, don't get emotional, just look at what happened, be very truthful to yourself, don't lie to yourself that, hey, I played well, but the game just didn't go well. Mm. Look at yourself, look at what you did right, look at what you did wrong, and correct it. You have to correct it every single time. Even if you think you played well look at still look at the game mm. and you won if you mm. look at the game think of what you did wrong think of what you did right how can you better it like stay hungry never ever stop for a minute because if you stop for a minute there's a younger person somewhere who is hungrier than you and is going to eat you for lunch yeah. nice ladies and gentlemen there you have it. Squatch or watch on the Fat Cats podcast. See you.